Okay, shall we start? Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of the Computer Architecture course. Today is Thursday, October 6th, and uh, we are going to start talking in detail about a uh, key trend in computer architecture these days that is processing in memory. Remember that this is something that we will uh, extensively introduce in the previous two lectures. Today, we are going to talk uh, in much more detail about uh, different types of processing in memory, we will start with uh, uh, some motivation again about why processing in memory capabilities are desirable in computer architectures these days. And then <clears throat> we will <clears throat> present sort of uh, classification for different types of processing in memory, as you'll see. And we spend more, we will spend more most of the lecture talking about processing using memory, which is one of the two main categories of processing in memory. So this is uh, our agenda for this meeting and the next uh, few meetings. We already talk about major trends affecting main memory. That was uh, the lecture last Friday. Uh, we talk as well about the need for intelligent memory controllers and what can be uh, achieved by uh, improving scheduling mechanisms and by giving more intelligence to memory controllers. Um, and uh, we will again mention that today. And uh, then we are going to talk about the two directions in processing in memory, processing using memory, processing near memory. We are going to describe what's the current landscape for both. That's what we will do today and in and, and today's and tomorrow's lectures. Um, and, um, and yeah, we will somehow give you as well an idea of what's the, let's say, current uh, a status of the development of all these techniques. Uh, tomorrow as well, uh, we will conclude and we will uh, mention like many things that are still needed in the computing systems in order to enable the adoption of processing in memory. So, okay, let's recap on some of the things that we started to discuss in the previous two lectures. Uh, we see that there are nowadays uh, three key system trends. The first one is that the data access is a major bottleneck and applications are increasingly data hungry. We see as well that energy consumption is a key limiter. This is something that affects uh, mobile devices, but also uh, large supercomputers is uh, one of the you know, key motivations these days to improve, to make our architectures more efficient. Data movement do energy dominates uh, compute, and this is especially true for off-chip to on-chip data movement. That's the costlier one, and that's why we are putting so much effort on improving computing systems by uh, uh, giving them processing and memory capabilities. Uh, an observation and an opportunity as well is that um, high latency and high, high energy caused by the data movement, and that's because there are long energy hungry interconnects, energy hungry electrical interfaces, and, and, and their movement of large amounts of data, more and more data these days that needs to be processed. The opportunity is that we can minimize data movement by performing computation directly near where the data resides. And there are different ways of calling this trend. The one that you're already more familiar with is processing in memory or PIM, but you can also call it in-memory computation or in-memory processing. A more uh, general term is uh, near data processing or NDP, something that you're also going to hear a lot in this course and, and, and in other sources as well. Uh, but it, because it's a general concept that is applicable to any data storage and movement unit, like caches, SSDs, main memory, network controllers, etc. We are going to see some good examples of all these different possibilities in today's lecture and uh, tomorrow's lecture as well. Uh, remember that these are like the, let's say, four key uh, issues that uh, our, group, our group focuses on in the research tries to uh, improve architectures from the security, reliability, and safety perspective, but also energy efficiency, uh, aiming to do architecture 
architectures, also higher performance, low latency, higher throughput, and, and specialized architectures. And this lecture today and these two lectures this week are mainly focused on these, right? Making computer architectures more energy efficient and uh, the solution or one, one way of doing it at least is to make computing systems more memory centric or more data centric. And, uh, and that's for a good reason, right? That there are, there are always like different uh, levels of needs that uh, we have to fulfill. This, or we want to fulfill, this is the uh, Maslow's hierarchy. You're probably familiar uh, with it. Something similar could be applied to computing systems as well. And if we really want to make our computing systems uh, reliable and we want to make them uh, efficient and useful, one of the things that it's uh, good to try to uh, ensure is uh, everlasting energy, right? That's something that it's a, it's a key concern these days. And one of the reasons is because we want computing systems that contribute to contribute to a more sustainable world, and we want to avoid images like this one, right? So the goal or the challenge and opportunity for the future is to uh, uh, make computing systems higher performance, more energy efficient, and more sustainable and all of them at the same time. Memory centric computing systems can help with that. The problem, as you already know, is the data access or the data movement. That's the major performance and energy bottleneck. And it turns out that the current design principles in computing systems cause a, a great energy waste and also a great performance loss. The reason, the key reason for that is that processing is done, is performed far away from where the data usually resides in memory and in storage. And uh, the reason for that is probably the way that computing systems have been built in the last 70, 80 years, or, or maybe even more, I'm not sure, um, uh, following what is called the von Neumann model, uh, where we have three different components, computation, communication units, and storage and memory units as you can see here uh, in the picture. If we want to compute something, we'll have to uh, ask the, compute, the, the computing unit to request data from the memory and the storage, and these uh, data and storage will come through the communication unit, right? The model itself is not the problem. The problem is how wide or narrow this communication unit is, how wide or narrow, how much data I can get per unit of time uh, in in this uh, in this uh, through this uh, communication unit, right? If you think after today's lecture, or after tomorrow's lecture, if you think about the von Neumann model and compare it to some of the processing in memory proposals that we are going to uh, present, you will see that some of them indeed are using the von Neumann model. The thing is that they managed to make this uh, communication unit much more. Uh, high bandwidth, higher bandwidth, and lower latency. That's the key of processing in memory. And here you have the same with pictures. So um, today's computing systems are overwhelmingly uh, processor-centric. So all the computation happens here. The memory and the storage are, are dumb. They are simply there to store data is uh, that let's say the intelligence is in the compute unit that needs to go to the memory and the storage and then uh, compute. So uh, the, the, this is why we talk about processor centric systems or conventional processor centric systems. So all data is process, processed in the processor. Uh, this is uh, at a great system cost, energy, execution cycles. And uh, the processor is heavily optimized, no doubt about that. If you look at the evolution of CPUs, GPUs in the last decades, you'll see that they improved a lot. Many of the improvements were indeed targeted at alleviating data movements, such as, for example, the, 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 the fact that both CPUs and GPUs have uh, large caches, they have large register files, uh, they, um, they, they are using more and more uh, higher and higher memory bandwidth uh, memories and, um, and, and or, or also prefetching, right? Another uh, way of alleviating the data movement is, uh, okay, it's having some sort of intelligence that says, okay, what's the next cache line that will be needed? I'm going to bring, bring it up, up from. We talked about prefetching the other day, also about the run ahead and execution. So the processor is heavily optimized, but the data storage units are dumb, right? And that's the uh, 
key problem in uh, computing systems. It's something that we motivated in the first lecture already. Uh, the, uh, the, remember this, uh, this uh, paper, it's the memory, stupid. Remember as well, uh, this uh, motivational data, uh, the large amount of execution time, uh, around 55% of the execution time is spent on uh, L2 misses, right? The run ahead paper that you may remember, the shorter version, and uh, and you can learn more about all of these uh, in uh, talks from Professor Mudlu and interviews. Uh, to continue with the motivation, let's recap on something that we already explained the other day. Remember this uh, analysis uh, for where's, where's warehouse scale workloads. Uh, from Google, uh, they analyze all these different workloads using the top-down approach. Remember, I explained you the other day that uh, it's a way of representing where the pipeline slots, pipeline cycles are spent, whether it's in efficiently retiring instructions or issues in the front end, and the, in the front end of the uh, computer or the CPU the, is due to bad speculation or the backend. And remember that, yeah, we see that most of these cycles are spent uh, in the backend and uh, most of the time waiting for data to come to the caches to be uh, later used by the uh, processing elements or the compute units. So perils of processor-centric design of these kind of uh, conventional processor-centric systems they are grossly imbalanced systems because all processing is done in one place. Everything else just stores and moves data. Data moves a lot. There is a lot of data movement. And this is uh, energy inefficient, it's low performance, and it's, com and it's complex. Uh, these complex and bloated processor and also accelerators, GPUs, but other accelerators as well, uh, it's, they, are, they are complex in order to try to tolerate uh, the, the data access from memory techniques like uh, prefetching or like fine grain multi-threading that is used in GPUs to hide the latency of accesses to memory and, uh, and uh, many other techniques that have been implemented over time in uh, conventional processor-centric uh, systems. Uh, there are complex hierarchies and mechanisms, and this is energy inefficient, low performance and complex. And remember as well that a lot of the effort has been put in the design of these processors has been put on alleviating data movement. And we already showed this slide the other day where we see that most of the processor, right, is dedicated to moving and storing data. The energy perspective as well, we already uh, saw this, uh, this uh, slide as well, uh, shows us that uh, computing, performing a double precision addition, for example, takes essentially between two and three orders of magnitude less energy than an access to DRAM, a DRAM read or a DRAM write. Um, and more uh, motivational data that we uh, already discussed in the previous lecture comprises this data movement 41% of uh, mobile system energy. Uh, but the cost, and in, according to these papers, the cost of an addition is uh, 115 times the cost of a memory access more motivational data, 62%, 62.7% of the total system energy on these uh, Google consumer workloads is spent on data movement. So we have uh, uh, a big issue here and as much as possible, we are going to try to not move data if it's not strictly necessary. And the way to do that is with a paradigm shift. Something needs to change in the way we design the computer architecture to enable minimal data movement, to compute where it makes sense, where the data resides. And what that means is that it's important that we really know where, where the data, where the, let's say, latest version of each data instance resides. Might turn out that is already in the cache of the CPU or the GPU. In that case, it wouldn't make sense to offload the computation to uh, processing in memory, right? And we indeed are going to see some uh, examples of uh, scheduling, right? And when to offload. This is one of the key questions to answer in order to enable processing in memory systems. So uh, we want to make computing architectures more data centric. The idea is uh, simple, right? You have a processor here, you have memory there. And in the normal case, what you're doing for all these workloads and many more, you are just uh, go into memory, requesting data, moving all the data through the interconnect to the processor and computing there. Uh, if the accesses are somehow regular and we can exploit the 
large bandwidth that in most of the cases this interconnect provides, we can do it in an efficient manner, we might be fine. In other cases, it might be really a mess that we are moving a lot of the cache lines and maybe most of the cache line is not even being used. That may happen in applications that have more irregular accesses like graph processing, for example. But even if the accesses are regular, it will all depend on how much computation we do here as well, right? If the arithmetic intensity, if the amount of computation per byte that we do here is also very small, it's probably better to think about an other way of uh, solving this problem, right? And this way can be processing in memory. The basic idea is that we will have some computation, some operation that we want to do, that we offload to the memory side. And there we will have some sort of compute capability, maybe a small general purpose processor, maybe a small accelerator, maybe something else that will perform the operation for the processor core, and then probably return some results. The idea looks simple, but still there are many questions to solve. That's why we do research on these topics. For example, uh, how should we design the compute capable memory and the memory controllers? Uh, how to design the processor chip and the memory units, the processors themselves that we put there in memory, um, hardware and software interfaces, system software, compiler, languages, and algorithms, and, and many more, right? So it's something that spans the whole stack in some sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that these are good questions and 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 are part of the, you know, in, in some sense, what you're doing is um revising these questions as well right so what you're asking are things that are needed in order to or considerations that are needed in order to really enable processing in memory and change the paradigm uh, so with respect to your first question data in memory changes it might change due to uh, two reasons for example the first reason is that the program itself changes the data because it writes new uh, or it modifies some input data or writes to new output arrays. Uh, that's fine and normal. That can be done by the CPU or can be done by processing elements in the memory or near the memory. So nothing changes in that sense. Another possibility is that we have sort of a, let's say, streaming workload. We have a large uh, data, large amount of data in storage for example, or coming from the network, and we have to process it, right? In the traditional way or the conventional processor-centric system, what we are doing is bringing all that data from the network or from the storage to the memory and then from the memory to the processor and then writing it back, right? If we have uh, compute units in the memory that is there in between and can save at least those transfers to the processor, we could be faster and we can be more energy efficient. But it's not only that. We are talking about, or I'm, I'm, I'm calling all of these uh, in, the, in a general way, I'm calling it processing in memory, but memory is also storage or storage is also memory, right? So we can as well place compute capabilities in the storage or maybe even in the network cards. You know, so there are, uh, you know, works in all different directions. That's that's uh, that's uh, completely, I mean, it's a very good concern indeed. It's a real concern. And now you have a much more distributed model of computation, and that's something to take into account as well. And, and, and that also entails challenges. 
For some workloads, it will be fine. You just offload the computation there to multiple units in different memory uh, chips, for example, and, uh, and, and they can operate independently. Those are good use cases. In some other cases, you will need some type of synchronization, right? across the different elements, some sort of communication, consolidate, partial results, uh, many different things, right? In those cases, it will be more challenging. And we are going to analyze that for sure, as well as uh, proposing ways of communicating more efficiently across these uh, uh, processing elements, okay? So all of these are very good questions. It's normal that you have these concerns when just starting. And we also have the same concerns and that's why uh, we are uh, doing, I mean, uh, exploring all these different directions. Let's go, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, a summary of uh, everything is uh, in this book chapter. I think it's a very complete one. It motivates the need for processing in memory, the need for intelligent memory controllers. It classifies the, the processing in memory types, and then it, it explains some relevant examples of processing using memory and processing near memory systems, as well as uh, uh, you know the, the, the corresponding section about how to enable processing in memory. It's a, I think it's a um, um, nice uh, reference and, and also a good source for you know, later or uh, expansion on your on your learning, right? Because from there uh, you'll see a lot of uh, papers uh, that are cited in uh, over over the book chapter. This is the uh, abstract. This is the table of contents. As you see, we start with uh, the need for intelligent memory controllers, the perils of uh, processor centric designs, two approaches to processing in memory that are processing using memory, processing near memory, and then. Uh, we conclude with the adoption, enabling the adoption of processing in memory. Processing in memory is processing data where it makes sense, and it's not a new idea, right? Same as the von Neumann model is not a new idea. The idea of processing uh, near the data or closer to the data is already, uh, I mean, has been already proposed more than 50 years ago. This is the oldest paper that I'm aware of. This is a, another uh, uh, around the same time by Harold Stone. Uh, but why processing in memory today and why not in the past? It's not only these two papers that were there. There have been a lot of uh, research during the 80s, during the 90s on how to enable processing in memory. And there were some fundamental challenges from the way that the uh, memories are fabricated. If you think about the DRAM technology process and compare it to CMOS, uh, technology process, they are fabricated in completely different ways. And this difference makes that creating logic using different technology is complicated, is very difficult. There are multiple reasons for that. The type of, pro of transistors that you use, so some are optimized, the CMOS transistors, they are optimized for uh, logic. The other transistors, the, the, the DRAM transistors are optimized to uh, reduce the, the, you know, the leaking of the cell charge onto the, onto the beat line. So the technology itself is optimized for different purposes, also fabricated in different ways. In DRAM, we typically have like three, four metal layers, while in CMOS, we have 10 metal layers of, or more. So if you want to create a processor, create logic inside the DRAM chip, it will be challenging and it will have uh, certain drawbacks. So all these technological limitations made that uh, computing in memory or processing in memory didn't become a reality among other possible factors as well. Um, but these days there are, were there are, uh, huge problems with memory technology because memory is uh, not scaling at the same pace anymore. And we see that there are multiple issues with DRAM scaling like reliability issues, uh, for example, the Rohammer phenomenon that we uh, introduced last uh, week are in the end reasons to rethink the way memory is built, is fabricated, is architected, and that enables as well an opportunity to redesign it and provide compute capabilities. There is also a huge demand from applications and systems because of the data access bottleneck, because uh, energy and power bottleneck because there is a lot of data movement and because indeed we have to operate on much more, much larger data sets these days than a few years ago. 
and, um, and, and we can improve all these metrics by minimizing data movement. So uh, designs are squeezed in the middle. So there is where we have to think about better designs uh, for memories that can uh, you know, alleviate in the end all these overheads and all these bottlenecks. And there have been <coughs> several, I mean, there are multiple uh, potential ways of doing this. Uh, relevant examples are uh, 3D stack memories, for example, the hybrid memory cube or the HPM uh, memory, high bandwidth memory. Um, as you see, these are basically composed by multiple layers of DRAM connected to a logic layer, a, a CMOS layer, and uh, through some vertical connections that are called TSVs or through silicon bias. Uh, these through silicon bias can bring the data to an external processor, of course, but also could potentially bring the data to some process ele elements residing here, right? And because it's so, uh, so close to the DRAM layers, to the memory layers, the, the uh, latency of access is going to be very low while the bandwidth can be higher, right? This is one example. Another example is the automata processing that was uh, presented by uh, Micron a few years ago. It's sort of uh, processing in memory, but uh, some, somehow limited in the amount of computation or the type of types of computation that you can have there. But there are um, even more recent examples that are uh, in the real world and uh, and, and are working in real systems, and we are working with them, such as, for example, the AppMan system it's fabricated in DDR4 memory, uh, placing some small processors called DPUs near the uh, memory arrays, near the DRAM uh, subarrays. Another example is uh, Samsung HVM PIM. I think I already mentioned this one in the previous lecture. This one is based on HVM memory. That is a type of uh, three stack memory. I think I have uh, some slides later. SK Hynix also uh, presented their uh, uh, GDDR6 AIM accelerator in memory uh, this year, or, or another proposal from Samsung. This one is uh, DIM based, or yeah, another one that. Uh, we'll also see later is uh, this one from Alibaba. So there have there are uh, you know uh, processing in memory is becoming a reality in, in multiple different ways and with uh, different uh, you know um, um, uh, involved parties. So it's uh, processing in memory can be a way of alleviating all these uh, that uh, all these uh, bottlenecks together with the uh, intelligent memory controllers. If you want to recap on memory scaling issues, this is a very good uh, paper for your reference. If you want to recap as well, or you want to learn about another uh, issue that are uh, the scaling issues, uh, this is also a very interesting study. And indeed, uh, we will talk tomorrow about, uh, yeah, we will talk tomorrow in detail about this work. It's, it's a very good example of uh, processing in memory accelerator fabricated in a coarse grain manner, let's say, uh, to be a, a standalone accelerator that can be connected, for example, through the PCI Express bus to a uh, host CPU. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, here we are. Yes, okay, here you can see a, a slide about the AppMan processing in memory or processing in DRAM architecture. Uh, I think I showed this uh, last week as well. These are uh, DDR4 chips, uh, DDR4 DIMMs with chips uh, following the DDR4 standard inside each of the chips. We have uh, memory arrays or DRAM subarrays and we also have or DRAM banks and we also have these uh, small processors called DPUs. I, uh, in, in this picture, what we see is the dual socket CPU, the host system connected to it. We have some DIMMs of uh, DRAM and we also have some DIMMs of PIM enabled memory. It's a uh, system that we have worked with, we have analyzed with a lot of detail and uh, we will likely talk uh, in more detail tomorrow and, and probably in a later lecture as well. This is a talk about this and, uh, and yeah, and this is the announcement from Samsung, uh, their first prototype function in memory DRAM uh, uh, um, uh, designed for uh, AI, uh, especially for AI inference. Uh, it's uh, based on HVN2 memory, as you see, also 3D stack memory, multiple DRAM layers. 
some of these layers have been modified to uh, integrate near the banks these uh, programmable compute unit blocks. Observe that this is a sort of a uh, small SIMD processor where we have a pipeline decoder to fetch instructions that are uh, residing in, one, in some of these uh, registers, the common register files. Uh, then we have here an array of multipliers. These are 16 multipliers that operate in a SIMD manner and then an uh, array of others, basically because this architecture is optimized for matrix operations, for dot product operations, right? That are widely used in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning these days. But uh, this makes that the uh, architecture itself is relatively simple, right? It cannot execute many different types of instructions. The AppMem architecture is general purpose and has a larger instruction set. Um, here, indeed, we have what we need, right? Addition, multiplication, multiplication and addition, or multiplication and accumulate, and some uh, control instructions. And this is the uh, yeah, picture of one of the layers uh, where you can see that each PCU block is connected to two uh, banks of uh, DRAM cells. If you want to learn uh, in much more detail about this architecture, you can watch this lecture from a uh, previous semester, from the spring semester. This one is from our PIM course. Uh, the second proposal from Samsung is based on, uh, it's a DIM based solution. And uh, it extends existing DIMs with some uh, FPEA, small FPEA that resides near the memory ranks, as you can see there on the right hand side in the prototype that they tested in this picture as well. And they showed uh, interesting uh, improvements for recommendation systems or for some steps of the recommendation systems. We, we also have a, a lecture about this one. You can watch later if you are interested in. From AIM, uh, so from SK Hynix, uh, another uh, major DRAM vendor. Remember that this is a relatively sim similar idea uh, to the Samsung one, to the FIMDRAM one. It's uh, targeted at the same type of workloads, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And what they do is also placing these processing units near the uh, memory banks. Uh, the, how they look, these processing units, again, what we have is an array of multipliers, and then we have an other three in order to perform the reduction operations. And interesting as well in this, uh, in this proposal is uh, the fact that they have uh, lookup tables and interpolation units in order to, uh, for, for activation functions. And, and, and this uh, supplementary SRAM buffer as well that is used to move data is uh, yeah, SRAM based and is used to move data from bank to bank. If you want to learn more, you can watch this lecture. And I think this is the last one of the real world uh, processing near memory proposals, because if you think about all of these, they have something in common. What they have in common is that they are placing some sort of compute unit near the memory. It might be some small general purpose processor, uh, such as AppMem. It might be a small CMD unit that is optimized or designed for certain particular operations like FIMDRAM or AIM, or it might be uh, something like this one uh, created for uh, uh, recommendation systems as well with two different types of uh, engine or uh, uh, specialized units or small accelerators that reside under the layer of uh, DRAM memory, as you see. This is uh, interesting as well because of the, so the way that is fabricated with this hybrid bonding system and is like, uh, like uh, somehow like uh, uh, creating a sandwich, right? With uh, peanut butter in between. As you see, you have the DRAM die here, you have the logic die here, and the hybrid bonding is uh, in between to allow fine grain communication uh, in, in between uh, both layers, between uh, where the data resides and the uh, accelerators. But as you see, is also processing near memory, right? So, and it makes sense as well the, uh, that the systems that uh, somehow uh, are uh, made available earlier or are designed earlier and become a reality are, um, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, easier to build because we are uh, putting the computation closer to the memory. It's not like 
the ideas that I'm going to present next today, uh, processing using memory, where we compute using the memory itself in some uh, different ways. Okay, yeah, uh, we also have a lecture about uh, the uh, Alibaba proposal. And, uh, and, and going back to this, yes? Uh, there's a question on YouTube I'm gonna read for you. Okay. It says, is memory store-based computing more compatible with in-memory computing? Is memory is what? Uh, it says, is memory store-based computing- Oh, memory store-based computing- More uh, compatible with in-memory computing. With in-memory computing, well, we can, uh, about uh, memory stores are a type of uh, non-volatile memory that are also used for processing in memory and in, part, in particular for processing using memory. And indeed, we are going to talk briefly about this today. And it would be compatible for sure with uh, other approaches to processing in memory, like processing near memory as well, right? You could have a, a compute capable memory array fabricated with memory stores and why not another uh, unit near this uh, memory array to perform other operations. So uh, indeed, a uh, combination of these uh, makes perfect sense. If there are technological challenges, of course, fabrication challenges, they, they, they will need uh, to be solved, but the, the idea of, of itself can be useful. Let's say that the architecture itself is, uh, you can expect that will be simpler. Uh, one key reason is that the amount of area that you have in these uh, logic layers, for example, uh, is usually not, not that large compared to the area that you have for a CPU or a GPU. There are, there are also uh, constraints related to thermal dissipation. Uh, if you look at a regular CPU or GPU, you'll see that it uh, consumes a lot of energy and generate a lot, uh, generates a lot of heat, right? So you cannot put layers on top of that, you know? So um, yeah, of course, the, the architectures in general will be simpler. We will see uh, some examples in more detail. Okay, any other question? Okay, uh, yeah, let me continue uh, with uh, another work that we can also talk, uh, we can also call near memory acceleration. Remember that the processing in memory term is a very uh, general. There are many different types of processing in memory. Uh, we are calling near memory processing or near data processing. Uh, we are also calling uh, uh, approaches where what we have is a uh, external accelerator connected through the uh, high bandwidth, uh, connected to an interposer to a high, uh, um, high bandwidth memory, HVM. Uh, you can find some uh, FPGA boards these days that come with their FPGA and then uh, an external memory, uh, HVM typically, and uh, providing very large bandwidth. And in some sense, we are also alleviating the data movement bottleneck because uh, here we are using much wider interconnects. The silicon interposer uh, has many more wires than a regular uh, mm, uh, memory bus. So <clears throat> uh, why we need the memory computation today? Because there is a push for te technology. DRAM uh, is at GeoParty and there are alternatives to improve uh, what DRAM uh, can give us these days. We have non-volatile memories, we have 3D stack memories as well. So there is a push from technology, but there is also a push from systems and applications. Systems and applications requiring accessing data very frequently and large amounts of, of data. <clears throat> and in all of these, uh, intelligent memory controllers can help. Hmm. Okay, so what's the uh, basic idea? To think in a different way, to shift the paradigm, and that's called processing in memory or you can talk about creating or designing more memory centric or more data centric uh, compute systems. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and in the end, uh, there are different ways of doing this. In our uh, book chapter, we talk about two main approaches. One is processing using memory. The other one is processing near memory. There are different technologies, different enabling technologies for both. Uh, we can do processing using memory with SRAM, with DRAM, 
with non-volatile memories, as you see, men restores, for example, uh, are here in this category. Uh, we will most, mostly focus today on DRAM because it's uh, probably what is uh, easier to uh, enable because uh, DRAM is a dominant, is still the dominant memory technology. Uh, and then we also have the processing near memory approaches. We will focus on them tomorrow, but there are many different uh, ways of doing it, like logic layer in three stack memories, uh, silicon interposers, as I just mentioned. Uh, we can have logic in memory controllers, in the memory chips. AppMem is an example of that. Uh, in memory modules, uh, like DIMMs, like AX DIMM from Samsung is here. Logic near the caches, the same idea of instead of placing the processor or small processor near the memory, you put it near the cache. There are multiple proposals about that as well, and also in storage devices. So these are the two main categories, the two main approaches. We are going to focus first today on uh, processing using memory. The idea is to take advantage of the operational principles of memory to perform bulk data movement and computation in memory. When we talk about the operational principles, <clears throat> we talk about uh, using charge, using, using current, using voltage to perform computations using the memory cells. So we can exploit as well the internal connectivity to move data. You'll see the uh, row clone uh, very soon, actually in the, in the next slides. Uh, very good example of how we can move data without going out of uh, memory. And we will also be able to exploit the analog computation capability. Ambit is a good example of that, and we are also going to cover it as well. These are some of the papers that uh, you know, follow this processing using memory approach. We are going to start simple with data copy and initialization. These are operations that are widely used in every program. You need to, uh, you need to copy data from one array to another array, or you need to uh, initialize data, for example, make all elements of an array zero or uh, things like that. And it's a uh, a problem that has been, or, or the, the, the overhead that these operations entail by, the, by themselves that are essentially moving data. There's pr practically, practically no computation in these operations. Um, these uh, entails an overhead in computing systems, in, in all computing systems, especially uh, critical in, in servers as well. And, <clears throat> and, and it's a problem that was uh, detected over time, right? And affects many, many different uh, important uh, applications and, and, and systems call, system calls that we use uh, these days. Uh, from the uh, Google paper, one of the Google papers that we have used for, for motivation, men move and men copy, they detected, take 5% of the cycles in Google's data centers. So 5%, even though is much smaller than 100%, but imagine what can be the cost of that in a large data center as uh, Google or any other uh, large company. And the problem is that the way that these operations are performed is by using the CPU. So if you want to copy one row or one page in memory to another uh, page in memory, you'll have to bring cache line by cache line to the processor, perform the copy operation, and then write back. And this is something that is high latency, is a high bandwidth utilization, occupying this channel, uh, <clears throat> this memory bus for a long time. Uh, it causes cache pollution for sure that can affect the performance of other applications that might or could use the uh, cache in a, in a more efficient way or in a more necessary way. And there is a lot of unwanted data movement. This is uh, costly, both in terms of latency, in terms of energy. Here you have some uh, real numbers for uh, four kilobyte page copy via uh, DMA operation. So what would be an ideal future computing system? Because in the end you have the source and the destination pages in memory, maybe even in the same chips in memory, uh, it's it kind of kind of um, something that kind of makes a lot of sense is to perform the copy directly, right? And this could be this could be low latency. This could save bandwidth. Uh, this could uh, or this wouldn't uh, cache uh, pollute the cache, and, and there is no unnecessary data movement, right? So uh, in 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 real uh, or yeah, in the simulation analysis, what we can show is that essentially reduce uh, the latency by two orders of magnitude and something similar for the energy consumption as well. What's the basic idea of row clone? 
In reality, it's pretty simple. Imagine that this is a DRAM subarray and you have here the sense amplifiers, the row buffer. The basic idea is to activate the row, open the row, which means that you move the row or transfer the row to the row buffer, and then next, write to a different row. You activate row B, and what that makes is that you transfer the row from the row buffer to the destination row. So observe that this is a super simple idea. Uh, it only needs two consecutive activates. It has negligible hardware cost. As you can see, this seems very feasible for existing DRAM chips, right? And indeed, we are going to talk later about the work that uh, they indeed have shown how to do this in, in real chip using uh, off-the-shelf uh, DRAM DIMMs. And it provides a very large latency reduction and energy reduction. Uh, um, the, the, the row on paper proposes different ways of moving data. The first one that we just saw is uh, intra-sub array. Here you have another view of it, more detailed one. You have a source row and a destination row. Observe that the, that particular cell in the, in, the, in the source row is charged. And here we have our access transistor, right? At some point we activate uh, this row. The cell starts leaking the charge onto the bit line. Then we amplify the difference by enabling the sense amplifier. This restores the charge, uh, but then we can uh, we can uh, yeah uh, activate the destination row, and this would copy the data from the sense amplifier to the destination cells. That's the basic idea, as you can see. And uh, yeah, another uh, picture here, activate the uh, source row, then activate the rest destination row, and this makes the copy. It's so simple. The row clone paper also proposes uh, other techniques. This one, because the, the, the previous one is needs to, the, the two rows need to be in the same subarray, as you have seen, because they use the uh, same local row buffer. Um, uh, but the row clone paper also proposes a way of uh, communicating data or moving data between different banks in the same chip by using the shared internal bus that the uh, chips themselves have in order to read and write from this chip IO. And uh, yeah, so the, the, the idea would be moving one by one cache lines from one row in one bank to another row in another bank. And these are uh, not so great in terms of latency and energy reduction, but is still uh, pretty good compared to the traditional approach that needs to bring everything to the processor and then move it back to the destination row. So uh, the paper somehow proposes a generalized row clone that can be either intra subarray, it can be inter bank, or it could also be intra uh, bank between two different uh, subarrays, right? In the in re, in reality, this third version is the one that that uh, is uh, worse in the row clone paper because the inter subarray copy is actually making use of the interbank copy. So if you want to copy from one subarray here to another subarray here, you have to move data from here to here and then from here to here. So that's why is the one that is uh, uh, let's say like like uh, uh, higher latency and and the the energy savings are not that high. But all of these <clears throat> can be enabled with uh, essentially negligible uh, area cost. And the results are pretty good in terms of latency, 11.6 for the faster version, that is the intra subarray copy, uh, and, and great energy savings as well. But even for the inter subarray copy, there are energy savings, as you see, right? Because it's uh, this bar uh, as compared to this one, that is the baseline. <laughs> Row clone can be used to <clears throat> copy and also to initialize. If you want to do so, you'll need to reserve some rows for the data that you want to use to initialize. For example, everything equals zero, right? And that can be done at very small loss in capacity because you need to reserve a row per server rate to do so. <clears throat> but provides also uh, interesting improvements in terms of, terms of latency and uh, energy consumption. And here you see a few more results. These are copy and uh, zeroing for the different versions right? in terms of latency reduction, in terms of uh, energy reduction as well. Worst case is inter rate. There is no actual reduction in latency, but there is still 50% reduction in uh, energy. 
and all at very low cost in terms of area. And here you see also some results. Uh, you can take a much closer look. You can also read the paper, of course. Uh, it's a very good one. Um, but yeah, this is for more realistic workloads, uh, boot up, compile, fork bank, memcached, et cetera. And, uh, and yeah, uh, we see that there is a large fraction of these workloads that it's uh, spending cycles on copy or on zeroing data. And uh, that's uh, essentially what we can save for in terms of IPC improvement, instructions per cycle uh, is the red bar or the black bar is the energy reduction. So uh, pretty good results for these real use cases as well. So in uh, the, the, the paper also covers the end-to-end -end system design, application, operating system, ISA, microarchitecture, and, and, and DRAM itself where uh, everything happens. Uh, there are uh, things that are as well, um, I mean, all these end-to-end uh, -end design considerations are uh, studied in the paper, how to communicate uh, occurrences of bulk copy initialization across the layers, how to ensure cache coherence, because maybe some of the data is residing in the uh, memory, right, in, the, in the caches and might need to be flushed in order to perform the operation on the memory side, how to maximize energy and energy savings, latency and energy savings, and how to handle data reuse. And this is the paper. If you want to learn more, you can read the paper. Also watch this lecture about Rocklong uh, delivered by Professor Mudlu last year. Um, it's, um, yeah, it, it will help you for sure to make up your mind and start thinking about memory as a potential accelerator. Roglong is already a way of using memory as an accelerator, even though it's for very reduced set of operations, only copy and initialization. But we are going to see that many more ideas can be enabled based on this idea or extending the idea a little bit. Uh, strengths of this work is simple and novel mechanism. It shows uh, efficiency and low overhead. It's an idea that is intuitive. Probably all of you, as soon as you saw how the, uh, it basically operates, are, you are thinking, why is this not already used in real systems? Is if it's so intuitive and simple? And uh, yeah, as you see, it has uh, multiple advantages. Of course, it also has certain weaknesses. We I, I've talked about the inter array copy that is uh, very efficiency, very inefficient, and uh, and indeed that uh, there are also indeed there are challenges. Right, we need to change the system end to end or many components of the system end to end in order to really enable the use of a technique like row clone on a real system. So we need to also work on end-to-end -end system design to enable these um, uh, techniques. And, and other um, things or weaknesses to consider, you have to figure out a way of maintaining cache coherence and, and so on and so forth. This could also be a weakness as well. We couldn't test it in real chips. Uh, it, this is tested in simulation, but as I said, there is a, an up, uh, upcoming work, <laughs> upcoming in the slides, that really tested this in uh, real chips. Okay, uh, when analyzing papers, and this is uh, as well uh, good uh, advice for you, you will have to analyze papers in this work, try to avoid rat holes when it comes to uh, being critical about how the performance or energy analysis was done. Improvements on Roklong, as I said, the idea, Roklong idea enabled uh, many more ideas later. Like for example, how to do faster inter array copy, right? It's one of the weaknesses of the original row clone. Well, the LISA paper provides uh, some way of doing so. We are going to see it next. But you can even uh, transfer data, or you may want to transfer data at smaller granularities. Uh, this other paper from Michael 2020, Figaro, proposes a way of transferring data in smaller granularities using the global row buffer or how to do better interbank copy. This is another proposal for three stack memories. And uh, the similar ideas, as I said, and we will see next, can also be used to compute on the data, such as the Ambit paper. This is uh, Lisa, the first one that we are going to discuss, uh, moving data inside DRAM, right? We already know that we have to move data through the uh, the processor, the motivation is the same as for the uh, Roklon paper, as you can imagine. The key idea in LISA is uh, in order to make uh, copies from one subarray to another subarray in the same bank in a much faster way, 
the idea is to connect these solar arrays using uh, um, isolation transistors. You know that internally the sub array is composed by many vertical bit lines. So the key idea here is to have the, uh, the, the uh, local row buffer here in between, and this local row buffer can be connected to one sub array or the other sub array. And this way we can move entire rows from one sub array to one other sub array that is adjacent and residing in the uh, same bank. It's a versatile substrate. It can be used for bulk data copy, providing significant uh, improvement over the baseline, right? If you compare these 9.2x to the one, there was actually no uh, latency reduction of the inter sub array in, in row clone, you see that the improvement is uh, pretty significant, but uh, this uh, idea of LISA has also uh, other use cases that you can check in the paper. Here you have also links to the other proposal, moving data at smaller granularity uh, in Figaro, the uh, network on memory uh, proposal. And, um, and yeah, now uh, we are going to continue talking about how to enable computation using the memory itself. That's something that has been around for seven years already. Uh, this is the uh, most uh, relevant paper, probably uh, the, the, the one that uh, essentially uh, came up with the a uh, whole idea of how to perform logic operations uh, inside memory and or and not operations using the memory cells themselves. And that's what we are going to discuss next. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, no, the, base, the basic idea is to connect the bit lanes of two subarrays using some isolation transistors. If you, if you uh, uh, switch on these transistors, you can move data uh, from the top part of the bit line to the bottom part of the bit line and then copy one entire row uh, to the other subarray. Yeah, somehow. It's, a, it's, a, it's also a very intuitive idea, as you can see. Okay, another follow-up work that hopefully we will have time to cover as well today is SIMDRAM that takes the ideas in Ambit and improves them and also provides a framework to create complex operations using the memory. But we will first talk about uh, others like, uh, um, um, yeah, for example, uh, let me mention these ones. Uh, uh, the, this uh, row clone proposal, these uh, ideas can be evaluated on a real system. Yes, that's what the Compute DRAM paper did. You have a, a couple of slides or one slide later. Um, it has also this, this type of operations or this type of computation has been explored in other types of memories as well. The Pinatubo paper is a good example of that for uh, phase change memory. Uh, these chart sharing properties can also be used to create other operations. These are examples that create paths and random numbers. Uh, we will mention them uh, later as well. And uh, yeah, still uh, we have to deal with uh, how to come up with more efficient solutions for uh, some of the issues, right? Um, this is the compute DRAM paper. As you see in the title, they managed to copy rows and to perform uh, indeed some ambit operations as well uh, using off the shelf DRAM. Uh, they tested this on a very concrete setup um, using uh, a soft MC that is an FPA based memory controller. We have uh, taken that basic idea and have integrated into an end to end framework that also implements an RISC V system in the uh, FEA, and this can be used as a host processor that can perform row clone operations in memory or uh, also generate random numbers in memory and then use them for, uh, uh, for real applications. So that's what the PyDRAM framework en enables, and it's completely uh, yeah, open source everything. And the, the paper is um, already in archive and, and will be soon in ACM TACO. And the, the, this is the, the other one, the, the one that uh, performs these bull bitwise operations in non-volatile memories, PCM in particular. So some key takeaways of this is still about the row from paper, a novel method to accelerate data copying and initialization is simple and effective, uh, hardware software cooperative, uh, great potential for work, uh, for work building on it and uh, to extend the different granularities, 
uh, more complex computation, etc. So we are going to continue uh, working uh, on explaining that. Let's go with the second point here, exploiting the analog computation capability. This is what enables us to have in-memory bulk bitwise operations. We can have uh, not only copy and zeroing, but also and, or, not, majority. We can use all of them at low cost without moving data out of DRAM, just taking advantage of an analog computation capability of DRAM. The key idea, as you will see, is based on activating multiple rows at the same time inside the same uh, subarray. And this, as you'll see, provides or can potentially provide very good performance and energy improvements. So it's not only an idea that is applicable to DRAM. It has also been proven in other uh, memory technologies. Memory restores are an example of them. And, uh, and yeah, all of them can operate with minimal data movement. So what's the key idea in the AMBIT paper, in this uh, book, Bitwise Computation? Um, it's uh, related to the way that uh, row clone works. And indeed, AMBIT also uses row clone because you'll have to move data around inside the same subarray before performing computation. But the basic idea of the computing, uh, of the computation itself, of the uh, um, um, logic operations themselves uh, in DRAM is uh, this triple row activation. Imagine that you have three rows inside the same subarray, A, B, and C. Uh, the particular cells in the picture, two of them are charged, one of them is discharged. The three rows are inactive, are closed at this uh, moment. And what we do is instead of activating just one of them and read or write to that row, what we do here is activating the three rows at the same time. And you know what happens when you switch on the access transistor is that the cells start leaking charge onto the bit line. Uh, we have this process of uh, charge sharing that is later amplified when we enable the uh, sense amplifier, right? What's going to happen uh, if we have uh, this delta deviation here? Remember that two of the cells were charged and the other cell was discharged, right? So we have a dominant direction of the charge, right? And so what that means is that when we enable the sense amplifier, the sense amplifier is going to amplify the majority. Two ones versus one zero will turn into a majority operation, will turn into all three uh, cells are uh, uh, in the end uh, charged after activating the sense amplifier. So that's the key idea uh, of uh, AMBI, the key idea of this in DRAM and on OR operation. The final state is this, that's essentially a majority function and this majority function can also be represented as this. So you have uh, two rows that will contain operands A and V. You can either do OR or you can do AND depending on what's the value in row C. If you have all uh, zeros, you will be doing and then if you have uh, in this row C are all ones, you will be doing or in all the different bit lines of the uh, same rows. Okay, the basic idea must be uh, clear. As you see, it's basically a, a majority operation, and this majority operation can uh, uh, I mean can be expressed as uh, this combination of a combination of and and or. So by controller, by controlling the uh, bits in row C, we can have AND or OR operations. Uh, one uh, key issue with this design is that we need to activate three rows at a time. And if you think about conventional DRAM designs, they are not designed to activate more than one row at a time inside the same subarray, right? So uh, AMBIT requires a modification of the row decoder or at least a small row decoder that is able to activate three rows at the same time. And that's indeed what in the paper is proposed. Extending the subarray with a small row decoder that can activate three rows. These three rows are going to be called the compute rows because are the ones that where, where we are going to perform this triple row activation. The rest of the decoder and the rest of the rows is same as usual. They can only activate a single row. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we need these special compute rows and this special decoder that can perform the triple row activation. So 
that's why we will need to row clone data from the original, uh, from the source rows where they uh, reside to these uh, compute rows where we are really going to perform the AMBIT operation. But in the end, the AMBIT operation is just an, activate, an activation uh, that will indeed activate three rows at the same time. And this way we can uh, either perform AND or we can perform OR in bulk. These ideas were presented uh, in 2015. Observe that we are missing something here in the title is AND and OR. If you really want to have a, a, a complete, uh, functionally complete set of operators, you also need NOT, right? Uh, so that was proposed later. The idea is to feed the negated value in the sense amplifier into a special row. Observe that the sense amplifier in the end is just like two inverters in opposed directions. So uh, whatever value you have in the bit line on this side, you will have the negated value. So uh, what the AMBIT paper proposes is to uh, include a row of these so-called dual contact cells. They have a regular word line and a regular access transistor connected to the bit line, but they also have another access transistor that is connected to the bit line bar. When you enable this N word line, you will move the negated value from the sense amplifier to the dual contact cell, to the cell itself. So this is the way of implementing NOT. And here you can see in a little bit more detail, we have some source that we want to invert. Uh, so we activate the uh, cell, the source cell there, then we activate the um, uh, sense amplifier, and then we activate this N word line of the dual contact cell in order to copy the inverted value to the row or the all inverted values to the row of dual contact cells. Any questions here? Okay, so as you can imagine, the, this uh, produces uh, amazing throughput improvement uh, for the basic operations, NOR and, and OR. As you can imagine, you can using this can create NAND, NOR, XOR, XNOR, uh, and more complex ones as well as we are going to see next. But uh, yeah, throughput is uh, really impressive compared to CPU, GPU, and even other processing memory uh, solutions. And here you see also some uh, results uh, for energy improvements as well. Uh, and, and yeah, even more results here, performance improvement and energy reduction, the mean is uh, 32 and 35 times respectively. And the good thing is that these bulk bitwise operations as, as they are right now and or not so simple, they can be used in some real world workloads such as bitmap indices, bit weaving, uh, bit funnel. You can find uh, all results in the paper. And here what we have is just, uh, and yeah, some, uh, um, a couple of plots. Um, so uh, th this is for one of the use cases, uh, the, the bitmap index. This one uh, basically perform, performs and operations inside DRAM. And then after performing the uh, bulk bitwise and, uh, the, the, the partial results are moved to the CPU for a bit count. So as you see, not all the computation is done in memory. Still, you will have to do some computation uh, in the CPU for uh, bit count in this particular case, and but it's still uh, you can obtain some uh, significant uh, extension time reduction for the whole benchmark, right? From 5.4 uh, 5 to 6.6 .6 times, depending on the number of users in the bitmap, the number of weeks for the particular analysis that has been done uh, in the paper. And these are results for another of the workloads, uh, bit weaving. We also see something between four and 12 performance improvement when using AMBIT. So remember the first paper in IEEE CAL in 2015, the second paper uh, was in micro 2017, uh, more recently uh, this uh, book chapter, and even more recently uh, the next idea to present today that is this uh, uh, yeah, SIMDRAM framework. Do you guys have any questions? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, what, 
Oh, yes, yes. Um, why, why is not used yeah. in the industry yet? Yeah. Well, it takes time to enable uh, the idea. So first of all, because you have to change the system. Uh, and that's why we also need to uh, work on, um, you know, at least uh, prototypes or frameworks that enable the end-to-end uh, -end system integration. If you want to use something as simple as row clone or Ambit, uh, you'll have to make sure that the data, the final, the, 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 the most recent version of the data is in DRAM. And that uh, means that you, 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 have, you need data coherence. So how do you enable this data coherence? What happens if the part of the data is for some reason in, in the on-chip memory, in, in, in a cache? Uh, so you'll probably need to have some, uh, some sort of coherent make coherence mechanism. Um, so I'm just uh, explaining a challenge, right? Another challenge, for example, Roglon can be uh, super fast, as you see, to copy one whole page to another page. Copying pages, for example, in uh, the operating system and, and some of the uh, real world workloads that were used are from the operating system. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's very frequent that you need to copy uh, one whole uh, page to another page. For example, when, when you do uh, what is called copy on write, you have two different processes that need to access the same page, but you know you don't copy the page from one process to the other process until this process makes a modification in that page, right? But you need to copy a page. Now, what's the problem if you want to, what's the challenge if you want to use Roclon? The challenge is that in order to be efficient, as you've seen, and use the fastest method, you need to make sure that the two pages are mapped onto the same subarray, right? And uh, right now, if you try to program this in your system, you don't have control if you try to do this in, in, in a conventional uh, system, you have no control of where the pages are allocated. It's something that is done by the operating system. You know as well that these pages might be, for example, swap out at some point, right? And sent to the storage um, uh, because virtual memory is larger than the physical memory. That's, that's why we need to swap out pages. So these are challenges that make that implementing the intuitive and really simple idea that you can do in DRAM, implementing it and using it in a real system is not as straightforward. So uh, challenges are a reality. Another reality is that uh, it's not always easy to convince everyone that this is something that makes sense and that you have to try and, and, you, and, and you should try to do. Uh, I think that uh, you know, the minds are changing Sometimes uh, slowly, but they in the end change, and 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 changes uh, will be enabled in the in the future. Mm -hmm. But yeah, even if you uh, think about AIM, uh, I presented this uh, AIM proposal from SK Hynix. They have this uh, SRAM based robot uh, global buffer. I think they call it, and I, and I explain uh, later that is used to move data up to two kilobytes from one uh, bank to another bank. In some sense, that's pretty similar to the interbank copy that Roclon proposes, right? A few uh, years earlier. So the ideas are becoming real in some and in, in different ways. Okay. Okay. So um, yeah. Um, so th this is the thing right now. Is two thirty. Uh, we have one point five more hours, right, to complete around half of the slides. So if you guys want to have a break right now, I think this is, can be a good point. Or I can continue, I'm fine. I don't need to rest. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's have a break. If you are fine with it, let's start in, let's get back, get back, get back to it in, in 10 minutes. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. 
Okay, I think we can continue. Um, yeah, we have uh, one hour, 20 minutes uh, for a few more slides. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope I'm not muted. Let me see. Okay. I don't know why I cannot see. Okay. 
Okay, well, whatever. I'm going to continue. If uh, I'm muted, someone will say something. Um, so, okay. Um, we have, uh, after motivating processing in memory, and that's what the lecture uh, started about, uh, we have started discussing uh, proposals on processing using memory, how to enable computation using the memory cells themselves. Uh, the basic idea is to uh, use the charge sharing process, the, this uh, analog operation of the different cells in order to either copy data or perform some logic operations, right? And this can be and or not, it can be majority as well. And we have indeed uh, seen some uh, simple workloads, real world workloads like bitmap indices uh, that uh, make use of them and we can accelerate them, right? But it, it still uh, is not uh, a uh, complete accelerator by itself, right? We need to enable uh, more complex operations if we uh, want to really make use of these in, in a more mainstream manner, in, in, in many different, in many more workloads. And that's what the Sindiran paper uh, tries to do. Proposes a framework for bit serial Cindy processing using DRAM. We managed to turn each of the bit lines inside DRAM into a Cindy lane. And hopefully this in the lane can execute any operation that you may want, an addition, a multiplication, a division, uh, the square root, um, the predicate, predicated uh, execution, et cetera, et cetera. We are going to see uh, some of the uh, example operations that you can enable or you can create using SIMDRAM. So the key idea in SIMDRAM is an end-to-end -end processing using DRAM framework that provides programming interface an ISA and hardware support for efficiently computing complex operation in DRAM and the ability to implement arbitrary operations as required. The user of the SINDIRAM framework can create whatever operations they need for their program. Um, this uh, using an DRAM massively parallel SIMD substrate that requires minimal changes to the DRAM architecture. I think I didn't mention it when I talk about AMBIT, uh, Ambit was, uh, so the, the area overhead of Ambit is like 1% or something like that. It's completely negligible. And since DRAM doesn't uh, add any extra hardware to the DRAM subarray or to the DRAM chip itself. Ambit, for example, needs a way of transposing data, as you will see, because here we are going to represent data or we are going to lay out data in a different manner, not horizontally as usual, but vertically. And we need a unit that transposes the data, but this unit is not in the DRAM itself. Uh, in, in, in the paper, uh, we propose to place it near the memory controller, but that's something we will uh, talk about at the end. Let's first focus on the processing using memory substrate. Um, this uh, SIMDRAM framework is built around uh, two techniques. The first one is the vertical data layout. We need to place data instead of doing it uh, horizontally, like uh, spanning, uh, um, uh, uh, expanding the cache line over uh, an entire row, we are going to place uh, words, we are going to place data elements vertically in the same bit line, a way that we have all bits of a word in the same bit line, as you can see uh, in the figure. This uh, has pros compared to the conventional horizontal layout is that we can shift data implicitly. In, uh, observe that uh, if we place data in a horizontal manner, and here we have, let's say, the most significant bit, and here we have the least significant bit, and then we perform uh, uh, like uh, and and or operations, at some point, we may want to uh, execute, uh, we, we may want to uh, implement more complex operations, for example, an addition, right? Think about a full other. In a full other, for each individual bit, from the least significant to the most significant bit, you will generate a carry every, for every single bit, right? So if you want to use that carry, you will need some way of shifting the carry from this bit line to the next bit line, from the next bit line to the next bit line, uh, and so on, right? And DRAM doesn't enable a way of doing it directly without hardware modification. So that's one good reason to place the data horizontally because with row clone, we can always shift data, right? We can always keep it, copy data from here to here, or maybe we don't even need to shift the data. We can just go and grab the bit that we need to operate on at that point. So we are going to operate in a bit serial manner, as you will see, or as you can see, for uh, the data that is vertically laid out. 
Uh, and it enables massive parallelism because all, div all uh, bit lines now become a SIMD lane. And the second technique that uh, SIMD run is based on is majority-based computation. Instead of using AND, OR, and NOT, that is a completely, as a functionally complete set, we are going to use majority and NOT that are also uh, uh, functionally complete. And this election of the uh, 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 logic set that we are going to use provides higher performance, higher throughput, and lower energy consumption in this kind of substrate. Why is that? Because what AMBIT supports natively is the majority operation. It's only that the AMBIT paper using this majority operation proposes a way of doing AND and doing OR. In SIMDGRAM, what we do is using the majority operation directly because with majority and not, the, uh, it's a, uh, we also have a functionally complete set and we can create any operation. So uh, the SIMDGRAM framework has three steps. In the first step, we generate the majority based logic. We assume that we start from some and or not logic. This is the, the, the circuit uh, for the, the desired operation that we want to implement. So we convert this into majority and not logic. And then because uh, AMBIT are just like activation and pre-charge commands is it like this uh, triple row activation, or maybe we want to do a row copy, uh, row, row clone operations to copy one row from, from their general rows, right? Data rows to the compute rows. But in the end, it's just the sequences of uh, different commands. Once we have the majority and not logic, we can relatively easily extract a microprogram that in reality is just a sequence of DRAM commands. This uh, microprogram is uh, encoded in certain ways, stored in memory. And whenever we want to uh, uh, create a new SIM DRAM operation, we will need to create a new microprogram. And whenever we want to use this, new SIMDRAM operation or SIMDRAM instruction, uh, we will have to load, go to memory and load the microprogram to the memory controller because this memory controller is the one that is going to read this microprogram, as you see, activate and pre-charge commands that are sent from the memory controller to the memory, to the DRAM subarrays in order to perform the computation. So that this is the, these are the three uh, main steps of uh, the Cinderian framework. And this is basically, these are basically the way of uh, creating uh, arbitrary operations and using them inside DRAM in a SIMD manner, right? Or massively parallel uh, manner. So let's uh, start with the uh, first step, uh, the, the generate the majority logic. Uh, in order to uh, do this, we, uh, well, uh, you, you could create from the and or representation, you could naively create the majority representation because as you remember, an and operation is majority where one of the inputs is zero, the or operation is majority where one of the inputs is one. That's something we already know from the uh, AMBIC paper. However, and even though we can do this transformation in a naive manner, uh, this is an, an optimized circuit. We can uh, apply uh, uh, certain uh, rules from uh, the, the Boolean algebra to this majority circuit and then create an optimized uh, implementation of the circuit. For example, this whole circuit here can convert it into something like that one. And by the way, if you check, that's the logic that we need to cal calculate the carry out for a full in a full other. So observe how from four logic gates, we are uh, moving to just one logic gate. So this optimization is uh, necessary. So that's what the, uh, what the uh, step one does, generating the optimized majority not implementation of the desired operation. And we did this by taking advantage of prior work that you can uh, find at the bottom of the slide. So in the second step, uh, we want to generate the sequence of DRAM commands, what we call the microprogram. Each of the sequences can be called a micro instruction, right? And we are going to generate it from the majority not representation of the circuit that we want to 
implement, right? Or the operation that we want to implement in CINDRAM. And uh, yeah, to do that, uh, yeah, we uh, in the end uh, create this series of microarchitectural operations, activate and pre-charge operations. This is our micro program. And here we have indeed two uh, tasks to do or two sub steps. The first one is to allocate DRAM rows to the operands. The second one is to generate the micro program. Remember that in the whole subarray, we have many rows that are just called data rows. They just store data as uh, down conventionally or usually in, uh, in DRAM. And then we have a set of rows, special ones that are called compute rows and are connected to this special row decoder that can activate three rows at the same time, right? That's what we have. So now if we have our data, original source data or uh, input operands, we have in certain data rows, we have to copy them to the compute rows. And when we copy, let's say, row A and row B to the compute rows, and then we perform some majority operation, for example, um, we will obtain some result. And this result may be needed later for further computation, for another micro operation, for another uh, instruction in this micro program, right? Where are we going to place these partial results? Are we going to copy them back to somewhere else? Are we going to keep them in the compute row? because we are going to use it right away. All this sequence is uh, what we do in this task one, defining how the rows are going to move from their original place to the compute rows, and then maybe to some temporary rows, and maybe we will have to read them again, and so on and so forth, right? In the paper, of course, you have uh, some good example uh, for, indeed, is for the uh, addition operation that where you will see exactly where to allocate the rows uh, to the operands. And indeed, we have, uh, if not the whole example, we have it here. So these are the compute rows. These are the data rows. Observe that we also have these uh, reserve rows, all ones or all zeros. Uh, depending on the operation we want to do. For example, if we need an AND or we need an OR. Um, and, uh, and, and there are uh, uh, so di different constraints to take into account. The first one is that the limited uh, number, so the, the, the number of rows for computation is limited. Here in the picture, you, have, you, you only see three. I think that uh, in the paper, we consider six. Some of them are uh, dual contact cells, rows of, a couple of them are rows of dual contact cells that we need for the not operation. So uh, we will have to copy from here to here, produce some partial result. This partial result might be uh, copied back to some temporary row and so on, right? So all these, uh, um, 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 yeah, all these allocation of the different rows to the operands uh, is uh, handled in this task one of the uh, step one. One constraint to take into account that the number of computation rows is uh, small. And the second constraint is that there is a structured behavior of the uh, triple row activation. So when you activate three rows at the same time, remember the three of them will end up having exactly the same value. So uh, that's something to consider as well when you orchestrate all these internal data movement and uh, operations. Uh, so because, yeah, uh, destructive because all of them are overwritten with the majority of it, right? Um, so, yeah, we have an allocation algorithm to perform these and use, uh, and the, the one thing that the allocation algorithm does is assigning as many inputs as possible uh, to the free compute rows because uh, this saves uh, from moving data from one original row to one um, uh, compute row, that's uh, one way of saving some of these uh, uh, micro operations that you need, uh, you will need later in the, in the micro program and, um, and, and, and also take advantage of the fact of the destructive behavior. So here we have three copies of the same result and we can use these three copies for different operations that we will perform later. So, but that depends on the, on the actual uh, uh, computation or the actual operation that we are implementing. So that's, uh, you know, uh, the, the first task, allocating different rows to the operands. The second task, once you have the different rows, you, can, you, you, you have these allocations, you can quickly generate the micro, micro program, right? If you know where these uh, 
A, B, and C in are going to uh, reside in which rows you'll have to, uh, uh, first of all, move them uh, to the reserve rows in order to uh, have them there in the compute rows and then perform the triple row activation that is a majority operation. And, and finally, uh, you will likely copy the output to some destination row or maybe some temporary row for later use and so on. So this is an initial microprogram. It's also possible to optimize uh, the microprogram. For example, it's possible to coalesce row copies uh, in case, uh, and I don't think this is a good example indeed, but in case where you have one source row that is going to be used uh, at different places and at different times, you can perform a row copy operation and in the uh, uh, in the destination, when, when activating the destination row, instead of activating one destination row, you can activate two, you can activate three, right? right? Because now you have a row decoder that can activate more than one row at a time. And in a row clone operation using this row decoder, uh, you could uh, perform three copies at once. So it's uh, what we call coalesce in the row copies. Uh, the uh, second thing is that some of these copies as well can be, some of these operations as well can be merged. For example, after, uh, so you can merge the majority operation, the triple row activation, you can merge it with a copy with a row clone operation. So what would be the idea here? You have three rows that are the operands in the compute rows. You activate the three of them at the same time and perform a majority operation, right? Because you have activated the three of them. But now remember how row clone works. You first activate the uh, source row, you later activate the destination row. So in this merge operation, what you do is first activate the three rows and then activate the destination row. And this way, you will have the majority result, not only in the three rows that you uh, used for the majority operation, but also in the destination row that is activated with the second activate operation, right? So that's uh, basically the, uh, the idea. Uh, you, you, you can um, find, of course, all the details uh, in the paper, and I will uh, later show you as well a link to a complete lecture that uh, Geraldo, who is one of the first authors of the paper, uh, delivered about this. So yeah, the optimized microprogram has a lower number of micro operations, so it will be faster as well, lower latency, right? And then the program or this microprogram might, might need to repeat multiple times we are operating bit serially. So what that means is if we are performing, for example, an addition and we have uh, n bit elements, n bit words, let's say four bit words, and we want to add these two, we first start with the least significant bit, bit zero of uh, element A and element B. We add them, obtain some uh, um, some result, some addition result and some carry. We use this carry for uh, the addition of the next two bits that are bit one of element A and bit one of element B. It's a bit serial algorithm, and that's why we have to repeat this as many times as bits we have. Here, you also see one of the drawbacks of this proposal of Syndirum is that the latency increases with the number of bits that we operate on. If it's an addition, the increase is linear, but if it's a multiplication, the increase is quadratic. So the latency increases a lot when you're trying to do multiplication here. Good thing is that the latency is relatively low for uh, you know, data, low data precision, and, 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 but, but the, the, the real advantage of this uh, proposal is that we have a, a whole lot of uh, bit lines that we can use all at the same time so it's more like throughput oriented computation. There, there is where the advantage of uh, Syndirum definitely comes. Uh, yeah, well, these are uh, how to generate a microprogram, store in a reserve, DRAM region for future use, uh, new Syndirum instruction that will be added to the uh, CPU ISA. So the CPU ISA, all CPU ISAs, as you may know, have, uh, I mean, they have their instructions, instructions in the instruction set. Each of these uh, have their own um, code, uh, instruction code, uh, but all ISAs usually have some risk, uh, some extra spare uh, instruction codes that can be used for other instructions added later, right? And, and, and we could create new Syndrome instructions and use um, these instruction codes from the uh, CPU ISA. Now, when in your program, 
you execute your program on the CPU, and the CPU, the pipeline of the CPU, identifies the instruction code of a new SIMDROM instruction. What the CPU pipeline will do is send the request to the memory controller for execution of this new instruction. So as you see, here we have to worry, or here we have to pay attention to the design of the substrate itself, how we make use of the SIMDRAM substrate, the subarray itself, but we also have to worry about the upper layers of the computing stack, such as the ISA, right? We need to provide programmers, compilers, and we need to provide the data path itself a way of identifying these instructions, these new instructions, and send them to the right place for execution, in this case, the memory controller. And that's what we do in the uh, step three. Once one instruction appears in the code, this could be a high-level language code, right? When this BBOB new instruction appears, is sent to the memory controller for the memory controller to uh, use so to access or to load the microprogram and then perform uh, the execution on the memory chips. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what we uh, uh, can talk about now. Uh, the SIMD, uh, SIMD run control unit in the end is an enhanced memory controller, is a memory controller that has a finite state machine uh, that is able to uh, read, load these microprograms and, and decode them and execute them. And is by issuing the uh, sequence of DRAM commands, activate and precharge operations to the DRAM chips. Uh, you can find much more in the paper. And actually, this is the, the whole design of the control unit or the, the, let's say, the extension of the memory controller, right? So here you see where the uh, microprogram resides. It's in a sort of a, a scratch pad. Uh, when uh, we receive the instruction from the CPU, uh, we load the microprogram. Then this microprogram is uh, accessed by this part of the uh, controller, instruction by instruction. Uh, identifying here, when we talk about registers, we are talking about the rows, the DRAM rows themselves, right? We need the addresses of these rows for the uh, processing FSM uh, to send uh, the, I mean, to indicate to the memory controller what are the DRAM commands to issue to the memory side, right? To the DRAM chip. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, you, you have the, the whole thing in the paper, same as in the paper you have uh, many other things like end-to-end uh, -end system implications uh, that we need to uh, deal with. Uh, one of them is the need for transposing data. As uh, we said in the beginning, in normal DRAM, we usually uh, place data in a horizontal way. If you have an entire world, uh, the, the bits of this world will all be in the same row, right? Or if you have a cache line, the whole cache line will be in the same row or maybe in uh, in different rows, in different chips, but in a horizontal uh, layout, in order to perform bit serial computation using SIMDRAM, we need to have the data vertically laid out, right? And the way of doing that is transposing the bits and place them this way. Um, there might be many different ways of doing this. You can do it even in software. You could have a library that does it uh, transparently uh, to the programmer, uh, um, um, because the library is already <laughs> coded, right? Uh, but yeah, that, that could be handled by a software library, for example. It could be done as is done in the uh, transposition unit that we propose in the paper, or it could even be done with some modifications of the DRAM subarray. In the end, the, the DRAM subarray is a matrix, right? So what you want is to transpose this matrix in some way. Um, that would be certainly more efficient in terms of performance and energy, uh, if you do it internally in DRAM, but will require modifications of the DRAM subarrays. And one of the uh, yeah, basic ideas of SIMDRAM is that we don't want to add more hardware or we don't want to modify the hardware more than what was proposed in the Ambit paper. So that's why um, we uh, came up with this transposition unit. As you see, it sits between the last level cache of the CPU and the memory controller. There is an object tracker to identify the arrays themselves, the data itself that we have to uh, transpose. And depending on the direction of the data, if we write from the CPU to the memory, we have this transpose, transpose buffer from horizontal to vertical transpose uh, when the CPU needs to read the data 
uh, we do the operation in a, uh, in the uh, in the opposite way, from vertical to horizontal. As you can imagine as well, we need these transpose buffers because we need to store, we need to keep there several cache lines because these cache lines will uh, keep the data vertically laid out. If you have one word in the horizontal layout, it's just in one single cache line, right? But when you put it vertically, the different bits will go to different cache lines. So that's why uh, we need these transpose buffers to keep this uh, uh, temporal storage for uh, the, the, all these cache lines. Uh, this has low impact on throughput of syndrome operations. Uh, it all depends on how much reuse uh, you do of the data on the on syndrome, right? On the memory subarray. If you are all the time moving data back and forth, you will have a latency issue, but that's... Uh, something that, that that's a problem that already existed right the data movement bottleneck uh, and yeah this uh proposal this proposed transposition unit has low area cost there is also an evaluation of the uh, latency that is needed uh, for the transposition in the paper same as there is a discussion about programming interface how to handle page faults other translation coherence uh, interrupts uh, the limited uh, summary size security implications and, and, and also the limitations of the framework. Um, let me very quickly show you some results. Uh, this analysis was done in uh, simulation comparing to a real CPU and a real GPU, uh, pretty powerful one, Titan 5. Uh, it's from 2017 with Volta architecture. So it's uh, uh, quite a modern one. Um, uh, we, we evaluate different configurations. First of all, one bank, the, most basic uh, syndrome design is just one bank, but as you know, memories have multiple banks. 16 memory banks is something uh, quite normal, and memories can exploit bank level parallelism. So it, that means that we can operate on multiple banks at the same time. So that essentially means that when uh, doubling or, or quadrupling the number of banks, we can multiply the uh, throughput by two or by four. With 16 banks, we are basically talking about a SIMD accelerator with a million uh, lanes, right? So we can operate on a million operands at the same time. Workloads that we use, first of all, we evaluate simple, I mean, only the operations themselves. They, we say they are complex because they are not only and, or, and not. Now they are things like uh, absolute value, addition, subtraction, bit count. Uh, we can compare with equality, greater, uh, greater equal uh, predication. I don't know if you are familiar with predication, but in the end, is a way of uh, um, uh, implementing control flow instead of using branches. Uh, you could have, let's say, some of the lanes active and some other lanes inactive, and then uh, you flip the bits of a mask, and then the rest of the lanes become active. That's a normal way of uh, implementing control flow in SIMD machines. GPUs, for example, use that. And, uh, and we figured out a way of doing predication in, uh, in the SIMD run, which means that we can execute, for example, code with if-else uh, in, in, in our code. Uh, yeah, and, and, and a few more, multiplication and division as well. And then seven real-world workloads, including databases, machine learning, uh, three neural networks, and even some uh, uh, graphics processing, throughput analysis in comparison to CPU, GPU, and AMBIT, because uh, SIMDRAM can be SIMDRAM or can be AMBIT, right? SIMDRAM can use majority-based computation or can use and or not based computation. So that's what we call AMBIT in these results. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you see, uh, very uh, nice, what is this? Normalized throughput, uh, great improvement over the CPU, not so great over the GPU, but uh, notice that here we are using only a single bank. Uh, here is four bank, here is six banks. If you think about the number of banks that the GPU has, it's probably larger than that. Uh, this Titan 5, I think it has uh, uh, five uh, memory channels uh, and uh, five stacks of HVM memory that in total provide about 700 gigabytes per second, which is a huge bandwidth, very in line with what modern, more capable uh, GPUs have these days. And we are only using 16 banks. 16 banks you have in a DRAM DIM, right? So um, that's uh, 
more or less for you to have a, an idea of how we are comparing. We are very conservative in the, in, in the results that we are showing. Observe as well that the throughput of syndrome kind scale as the memory becomes larger, right? And, and we are uh, staying with a relatively small configuration. And then the comparison to AMBIT. Um, yeah, so SIMDGRAM significantly outperforms the state-of-the-art baselines. And in terms of energy, it looks more or less uh, like the same uh, amazing energy savings compared to CPU, quite good compared to GPU, and also good compared to uh, AMBIT. So SIMDGRAM is more energy efficient than the baselines. And these are results for the seven real-world applications uh, yeah, observe that there are also some uh, interesting uh, speed up. It's a logarithmic yeah. scale, as you see. Okay, yeah, any questions? Yes. How do you do this masking that I mentioned earlier, the predication? Uh, so imagine just an uh, if else statement. Uh, what you usually have is some. Uh, uh, predicate that you need to evaluate in the if, like for example, is A greater than zero. Um, so that's one of the operations that Sindiran implements in order to compare two numbers that basically what you have to do is, is to subtract them and then check the sign bit, right? And uh, so we, we, we support, or Sindiran supports subtraction because it supports addition. So if, if it supports subtraction, then you can support uh, if something is equal or greater or 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 lower than, right? So that that's the thing. This way you create the mask. You have uh, as many lanes as bit as bit lines. So in each of them you evaluate one predicate, right? For each of them you have one if. So you evaluate the predicate and then you will have zero or one, depending on whether the condition was true or not, right? And then and, and that's the mask that you will use for the predication. The predication means that you um, perform some operation that you have in the body of the if, and at the end, you check the mask. Where you have one, you will store the result and the destination where you have zero, you don't care, basically. So that's the way of doing the if, after that you complement the mask, flip all the bits, and then perform the else the body of the uh, else part, right? So that's how predication works. That's how it works in Cinderian, but that's how it works in uh, SIMD machines, in GPUs as well. So it's, it's essentially that. Difference, for example, with GPUs is that the mask is per warp. In a GPU, you have 32 threads executing together. So the mask is much smaller. It's just 32 bits. Here you have a mask for the whole row that might be 64K elements, 64K bits, for example, is the, the whole row. It all depends on, on how wide is this array. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, so this is a summary of results in terms of throughput, energy efficiency, performance of real world applications. And in conclusion, Sindiran enables efficient computation of a flexible set and wide range of operations in a massively parallel uh, SIMD substrate uh, provides hardware programming ISA support. So it's an end-to-end it's -end, uh, design. And in the paper, you can find uh, all the details about all these different aspects of the design. It's a promising uh, processing using memory framework that can ease the adoption of processing using DRAM architecture. It can ease the adoption because now you can use it to create complex operations, right? That are more useful in real world programs. And that, that is done by improving the uh, performance and efficiency of uh, prior uh, proposals, such as AMBIT as well. So if you want to learn uh, much more, like the whole one hour lecture, or one hour, 11 minutes lecture uh, from uh, Geraldo, this one corresponds to the PIM course uh, the, uh, delivered uh, last semester. So now we know that we can compute in memory. Uh, we can learn how to do even more things like for example, uh, creating non random numbers or obtaining physical and clonable functions. That's something that uh, was uh, also proposed a few years ago and it has uh, <clears throat> many similarities with how uh, row clone or ambit operate. In the end, it's just playing with uh, different latencies, playing with the way that uh, we, uh, 
use the, the analog operation of DRAM. Uh, in this uh, particular case, it's, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the basic idea in this DRAM latency path work is uh, uh, playing with the latency of access, changing the um, uh, DRAM timing parameters. You know that in order for DRAM to operate properly, there are certain uh, timing, certain periods of periods of time that you have to respect. When you activate a row, you have to wait a few nanoseconds until before the sense amplifier is activated. Why is that? Because the cell needs to leak, leak charge onto the beat line and and so on and so forth. So that's why the operation in DRAM is very uh, is very much timed. It's very synchronous, uh, right? But if you play with these latencies, you will have some sort of unexpected behavior, right? And this unexpected behavior, depending also on process variation, depending on the uh, intrinsic characteristics of the transistors, the DRAM cells that are uh, there, and, and, and even the sense amplifiers, uh, yeah, you will obtain uh, 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 different beats, right? And, and you may obtain sometimes uh, the same beats that, uh, the, depending on the process variation, will uh, allow you create one of these uh, physical and clonable functions, or you can also use the same principles to perform, to obtain true random numbers inside DRAM with uh, you know very uh, lightweight, very uh, simple operation just by playing with the DRAM timing parameters. And we can consider this also a way of, the, of doing processing using memory, right? Because we are using the memory to generate data, for example, random numbers. Another way was proposed more recently, the quack TRNG. Uh, I think I mentioned this in a, in a previous class. Uh, it's uh, somehow based on the idea of Ambit as well, but instead of uh, activating three rows for a majority function, you activate four rows. Now there is no clear majority, and that's why the result will be a random number. It will be a random bit. And uh, this work takes advantage of uh, the, this idea of activating four rows at the same time. And this change is an end-to-end -end system design that makes use of these true random number generators. Also interesting reading. It's not the only thing uh, that we are doing uh, with DRAM. Uh, there is another uh, somehow evolution of the Ambit work as well. This one is called Pluto. It takes uh, advantage of uh, and or not majority as uh, they were proposed by the Ambit paper, but also uh, modifies the uh, DRAM subarrays in order to enable lookup table queries. Lookup table queries can be pretty useful. They are not so, uh, lookup tables are not so much widely used in conventional processor centric systems because a lookup table requires you to access memory, right? And if you have fast uh, ALUs, fast compute units in the processor, you can compute there instead of going to memory for to, to, uh, to get some pre-calculated value, for example. So that's why lookup tables are not so much used in CPUs and GPUs. They are they indeed used very much in FPGAs, for example, uh, but in processing in memory, they, they make sense for sure, right? Because uh, data is in memory, you are not moving data uh, so much anymore. Uh, so performing lookup table queries inside DRAM uh, can be pretty useful as we show in this paper that was indeed presented two days ago at Micro. Uh, hopefully we will have uh, some uh, uh, talk and some uh, recording of the talk um, in YouTube soon. Another uh, uh, related proposal, but this one is for NAND flash memories. It's, it's, it's the kind of the ambit for NAND flash. Uh, so it's the ambit for storage. Uh, it's, uh, it's still, I mean, it's also presented in Micro. Um, I think this one was yesterday. Um, it, it still needs to evolve to, to, to become more usable, but Flash Cosmos already provides a way of performing an or and not inside the uh, NAND Flash chips. And uh, even though you may think that all these techniques that we are proposing here are like very futuristic, maybe too, different to impl too difficult to implement in real systems, and uh, maybe not even doable in real chips, the truth is that someone uh, was able, this group was able to uh, uh, mimic a row clone operation and even ambit operation by violating DRAM timing parameters. In some sense, they managed to do this 
subsequent activate operations, activate, activate pre-chart operation that is needed in Roclong and is used as well in Ambit, also in CINDRAM, they managed to mimic this activate, activate pre-charge operation by violating the runtiming parameters in a similar way as it's also done in, in, in these other previous works that uh, generate random numbers. So we are going to talk about uh, com compute DRAM at the very end of the lecture. Um, I mentioned this one already as well, uh, the Pi DRAM uh, framework uh, takes advantage of the findings by compute DRAM in order to integrate row clone into an end-to-end -end system, right? And remember, uh, it's uh, uh, implemented on an FPA board where we have a RISC-5 uh, CPU and we have this PIM enabled DIM that uh, can do row clone. And um, the platform uh, allows us to explore uh, let's say real world challenges, end-to-end -end system challenges uh, that uh, are necessary to solve in order to enable these kind of operations in real systems. And as I said uh, earlier as well, it's uh, everything is uh, uh, publicly available. Pinatubo, uh, I, I've already shown you this before, is uh, the ambit of non-volatile memory, is ambit on uh, PCM memory in their paper, as you can see in this uh, a figure they explain how to do uh, row clone copies or row copies and how to perform uh, logic operations inside DRAM as well. And it's also not the only way of operating using non volatile memories. That's, let's say, kind of digital computation, right? Because you are doing AND or not. So you, you're treating each bit as is, as zero or as one. Non volatile memories can also be used these days to perform directly analog computation and some non-volatile memory technologies can be used like these ones and restores, resistive RAM, facing memory, STTM RAM can be used to build crossbar arrays. These crossbar arrays can perform dot product operations using analog computation capability. And uh, it's also a pretty uh, fancy idea, I would say, but also based on some uh, simple principle. In this case, uh, Kirchhoff laws. You remember Kirchhoff laws? Uh, uh, they give you the, um, uh, the, 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 the bit line current as a sum of products uh, that take into account the resistance of a cell and the voltage, right? So it's computation in the analog domain. If you have uh, I equal V uh, divided by R, uh, you are doing a dot product operation because you are performing multiplications and then uh, you can perform uh, accumulations, right? It's basically this uh, equation here. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you, we, we are multiplying two elements, V1 and the conductance G1, and then adding another voltage V2 times the conductance V2, and this gives us uh, at a final uh, uh, current value. So, but this, the way it looks, is essentially a dot product operation. So, many recent proposals in the last six, seven years are exploiting this uh, e memory crossbar analog computation uh, to perform uh, vector, vector matrix multiplication and to uh, uh, execute uh, neural networks, for example. And here you have a, um, a view of how this more or less works, right? We have this, uh, this is how the crossbar looks. These are the memory cells themselves. This can be PCM, can be a main restore, for example. It's a, basically a resistant, the resistance value that we can program. And, um, and then uh, we uh, have uh, certain voltages in, in these uh, word lines as they input uh, by using the main restore or other device, uh, we perform the multiplications that finally are accumulated in this um, I1. So I1 is basically equal to this, that is a dot product operation, as you see, operating everything in the analog domain. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's why it can be used to perform uh, matrix vector multiplication, for example, or matrix matrix multiplication. So in some sense, also looks like a systolic array, if you think about it. Okay, and that those would be the outputs. And here you have like four, uh, yeah, interesting papers, uh, very good references. Maybe some of them will be uh, recommended readings in your homework. 
uh, but for sure it's good that you uh, check them if you are interested in this type of processing using non-volatile memories. As you see, it's also using memory because it's using the memory cells themselves directly to perform the computation is different from AMBIT or is different from SIMDRAM because in AMBIT and SIMDRAM we represent the data as digital values, as bits, zeros and ones, while here they are analog values. They are either voltage or current, right? But it's processing using memory as well. So there is no need. I mean, the question is, does memory have to be done? There is no need for memory to be done. Memory can do things and we can create better architectures with minimal data movement. And that's something that not everyone is in favor of or was in favor of uh, for uh, for a long time, I, indeed. Um, and, and yeah, in the next slides, actually, you have something a pretty um, interesting, might be interesting for some of you. Uh, I will go very, very quickly over these slides. There are some excerpts of uh, reviews in, ma in major conferences, reviews of the Rochrome paper and the Ambit paper. You, will, you can grasp from there what were the impressions of the first people who read about these ideas, what were the pros and cons that they observed uh, in these uh, techniques, in these promising techniques, and um, and and how at at some point they, uh, people also changed changed their mind, accepted the papers, were presented in major conferences, and they created an impact in other research in uh, academia, but also um, they are uh, creating an impact in uh, industry as well. So as I said, uh, very very. Uh, quickly over these, uh, I, I don't want to spend time. Uh, some of them said the idea is not new. Some of them said the idea is good, but uh, it's this is not so important. The, the good thing is that in between there were also uh, interesting publications like this uh, ISCA 2015 paper that you already know, uh, profiling a worse, uh, warehouse scale computer uh, where they all, they indeed talk about mem copy and mem move. Remember, five percent of all the execution cycles in Google data centers. Uh, so, all these works also serve for motivate, serve as motivation for, uh, let's say, uh, original techniques uh, such as row clone or ambit. So that's about row clone. This is about um, ambit. <clears throat> it's a disruptive disruptive work, and that's why. Sometimes it was, or the beginning, it was dismissed by many reviewers. Uh, but yeah, you see, rejected from several conferences. Uh, but yeah, uh, a clever, novel idea, but probably this won't ever be built. Well, I think that uh, a few years later, we can think that it's not so difficult or so impossible that will, this will uh, indeed uh, build uh, sooner than later. Okay. Um, yeah, and yeah, um, in, in terms of how to uh, read about novel ideas, uh, it's, it's, it's all about mindset as well. And, and here you have a recommended uh, book from uh, Professor Mudlu, The Art of uh, Computer Systems Performance Analysis. Uh, don't fall into the rat holes when uh, analyzing the performance of uh, your proposals. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and of course, please don't have this mindset. You say, says there are reasons for not accepting the results of an analysis. Why change? It's working okay. Well, systems, current computing systems are not working so okay as uh, we have uh, identified, characterized, and uh, we are motivating in these lectures. So these are some uh, suggestions uh, to reviewers, like uh, do not block or delay scientific pro uh, progress. Okay, so yeah, we need to fix uh, the reviewer accountability, same as we need uh, intelligent controllers, and um, and that's something that will be pretty good for the research community. Uh, you can uh, read more or learn more about uh, all these um, ideas, all these um, uh, way of um, analyzing things, the reality, analyzing uh, how to do research in some of the uh, talks and interviews of Professor Mudlu. 
And the truth is that this is not so far from reality. It uh, might not have been fabricated in a, a real chip yet, something that you can use, something that you can have on your CPU or your, uh, I mean, on, in, on your laptop or on your cell phone or in a, in a server, but it's something, <clears throat> something that is not so far from the real world. <clears throat> and this is where the uh, compute DRAM work in micro 9, uh, 2019 was very timely because by using um, the soft NC FPGA based uh, memory controller, they were man they managed to uh, <clears throat> mimic the raw clone operation, but also ambit operations as well. Um, the way of doing the raw copy, remember that in the raw copy, what we have to do is to, in the, in the original row clone paper, the proposed idea is to activate one row, then activate another row, and then you close the row. That's what you do with the pre-charge operation. So row clone proposes three commands, activate, activate, and pre-charge, right? The problem in real DRAM chips is that you cannot issue two activates back to back. You need to always have a pre-charge uh, in between two activates. So you cannot activate two rows without pre-charging the first row that you activated. What compute DRAM authors managed to do is mimicking this back-to-back uh, -back activation by making these two times, T1 and T2, very, very small. Essentially, maybe even zero cycles. So the, the, the memory controller issues the, the pre-charge operation right after the activate uh, operation. And what that makes is that the DRAM row gets not completely closed. The sense amplifier is not able to really uh, execute this pre-charge operation, to really close the row. And when the sense, when the memory controller issues the second activate command, the first row is still open. And that's indeed what you can see here in all the steps. We activate row one, the cell starts leaking charge, changing the voltage of the bit line. Uh, in this case, uh, it's, go, it's going higher. At some point, uh, we uh, pre-charge, but very, very quickly we activate the second one, what makes that the second one also, so what makes that the second one starts uh, um, getting the charge that is in the beat line from the uh, first uh, row, from row one, right? And this way, both of them get the same value. So that's the uh, basic idea. The, I mean, the basic idea is the same as in row clone, it's activating two rows. The magic in these compute, compute DRAM work is that they manage to mimic these back-to-back -back activations by uh, making these T1 and T2 very small. And for, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that, that's the uh, entire explanation. So the BIB line is above, is above half, BB, BB, uh, half BDD when row two is activated. You see so that the voltage of the bit line is still uh, pretty high when the second row gets active, uh, the, it, it gets uh, essentially charged with the same charge that the uh, bit line has. Okay, and then there is a, a way of uh, doing bitwise and and or. It's this this one is uh, um, uh, way more complicated, and actually they could not do it in the different different chips that they analyze. Only in a very very few of them. Um, they have somehow a hypothesis of how of why this work of what how they could they manage to activate three rows at the same time and the reason uh, resides in the in the row decoder uh, they um, uh, they think that the row decoder for those different chips uh, behaves in a way that uh, when uh, changing an address from let's say zero zero to uh, zero one for example no actually it's, it's the other way around changing from this uh, uh, 0, 1 to 1, 0, um, the row decoder first changes one bit and then changes the other bit. And that makes that a third address, in this case, address 0, 0, appears in the uh, address bus. And by doing so, and by doing you know, similar operation to uh, what uh, the, the row clone, I mean, what they did for the row copy, 
reducing this uh, T1 and T2 essentially to zero, they manage to mimic the activation of three rows at the same time and performing an ambit operation, either and or or. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's um, more or less. Yeah. Uh, the first of all, we activate R1. Uh, T1 uh, very short, this T1 very short, uh, so the sense amplifiers are not uh, activated. Then also T2 very short, and uh, we change from R1 to R2. And while doing this change from 0, 1 to 1, 0, 0, 0 appears on the address bus, and this activates R3 for just uh, very small amount of time, but enough for it to start uh, leaking charge uh, onto the bit line and that and this way performing the uh, the an operation. So as you see, this was probably a matter of luck, but they indeed showed that it wasn't impossible to perform these operations using the real DRAM chips. So now imagine if you design the DRAM chips to not only store data and and have a capacity and 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 store bits, but also uh, design them to perform copies or, or bitwise operations. Okay, and all of that was done with the uh, soft NC uh, um, uh, memory controller. Here you see a table with the evaluated DRAM modules uh, from different uh, vendors, Esky Hynix, Samsung, Micron, etc. In total, uh, 32 DDR3 modules, uh, around 256 DRAM chips, uh, this is how they perform the experiments, the uh, proof of concept, selecting a random subarray, filling the subarray with some random data, and then issuing activate, pre-charge activate with different T1 and T2. They played with this T1 and T2 in number of cycles uh, to see, um, because not all uh, different chips uh, behave exactly the same way. As you will see, then they read out the uh, subarray and, uh, and then they find out where the, uh, the, the intended operation was actually done. That's what they did. So there is a success ratio. Uh, it's more than enough for the proof of concept. Not in all cases you can, uh, you know, you, you manage to copy all rows, only uh, those with the darker blue. In some cases, what's something between zero and 80%. In other cases, simply uh, there is no operation. And the way to read these, uh, these grids, is by, so for different chips, as you see from the different vendors, the different values uh, in number of cycles that they used for T1 and T2. So in some cases is when these two are zero, zero. In some other cases, the different uh, values of T1 and T2 may also work as well, right? And the pattern, uh, as you see, changes a lot from, from vendor to vendor, from, from uh, chip to chip, but yeah, the most important thing here is that they managed to uh, provide a proof of concept for row clone and for ambit. In, indeed, yeah, let's say that the ambit on all columns only work on, on this chip, uh, as you can see. Okay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and as I said earlier as well, uh, we took the learnings from the compute DRAM paper and, uh, and, and propose this end-to-end uh, -end FPGA based framework uh, for end-to-end -end, uh, studies with processing using memory. It's a flexible platform to explore end-to-end -end implementation of PUN techniques. It has uh, uh, hardware and software that is provided, a library to uh, make use of these uh, techniques, um, uh, everything implemented on an FPGA board. And, and here you see more or less the um, PyDRAM work, workflow. Um, uh, th th this is the CPU, it's a, a simple uh, rocket chip, RISC-V CPU core um, on, on, on which we have some user application running. This user application needs to make use of the library that um, uh, the PyDRAM provides uh, because that's a way of uh, performing, for example, a copy operation as you see here. Um, this rocket chip will read the instruction and then will um, send the corresponding uh, signal to the memory controller. And this make memory controller essentially replicates what the compute DRAM work did, right? Activating 
two rows at the same time or activity in first one row and then the other row in, in order to perform a row clone operation. The ambit operation, because it's not so easy to replicate, we couldn't or we didn't try it yet um, using PyDRAM. Uh, but yeah, row clone was uh, indeed tested, not only row clone, also D range, which is one of the proposals for random number generation. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, um, yeah pretty interesting tool that might have uh, good uses for end-to-end -end studies of processing using memory techniques. And here you, you can indeed see some results in terms of throughput improvement for initialize and for copy. So is it uh, zeroing or, or copying rows, uh, same as we uh, saw in the original row clone work, but here uh, in somehow even though it's an experimental platform, but it's an end-to-end -end system that even runs an operating system and runs uh, real applications. And this is open source and you have an extended version of it in archive. And there are also uh, different videos in YouTube, uh, at least uh, one, I, I remember at least two. Uh, this is the most recent one probably. Uh, from what well, is actually not the most recent one because we, I think we also had this talk in the um, spring semester, but yeah, uh, it's um, a longer version um, of the talk. And, um, and yeah, uh, this is just to remark that these row clone and bitwise operations are on, only possible, not only in DRAM, but also in other memory technologies. So what these works prove, uh, what compute DRAM, Pi DRAM, uh, something like Pinatubo that uh, exploit uh, similar ideas in other types of memories is that um, there is a real uh, future for these kind of processing using memory techniques that can be extremely promising and, uh, and also uh, exciting. So uh, whenever you have a research idea you want to explore and you are sure that, or you have the intuition that it will work well, follow your passion and don't get derailed. So be resilient, Focus on learning and scholarship. Uh, the quality of your work defines your impact and work hard to enable your passion. So, because you can make a good impact on the world. Uh, again, remember you some, um, yeah, interesting talks and interviews of Professor Mutlu, such as this one. Remember as well uh, what you learn or what you're learning with uh, Richard Hammings' uh, speech, you and your research. Uh, you need to know yourself, your weaknesses, your strengths become, so your uh, defects can become an asset. Uh, the people who are not successful is because they are not working on important problems, uh, be because they don't become emotionally involved and uh, they end up saying that they were not lucky, right? But um, yeah, you now know and have a uh, good, uh, probably have, can have good inspiration uh, on on all these works that uh, we are presenting. We are presenting today, tomorrow, and in later lectures as well. Uh, we hope that they will be a source of inspiration as well for your work and for your research. So that's all. Um, you guys have more questions, or we still have a few minutes. Um, we can um, clarify anything. Yeah. yeah the question about uh, analog computing, uh, like for like all this processing using memory, mm -hmm. the upload the properties of the memory. Yes. Um, I, I think the problem of the, uh, using this is that uh, maybe uh, like it relies a lot on the, the hardware. And so, like, if there are two cells, might be. Uh, Errors in production that is maybe a bit different. And do you think that this will uh, impact negatively the um, like how this works? Yeah, uh, this is a, it's an excellent question. And actually, the concerns uh, with these uh, kind of processing using memory substrates go very much in this direction reliability. Um, there are real prototypes uh, from companies, from uh, from uh, from academia as well. Uh, the closest thing we have, as far as I can remember, is here at IBM. There is a work um, exploring, implementing, and, and real devices with these uh, crossbars using PCM memory. And indeed, 
uh, one of the things that they need to pay more attention to is the reliability so, and, and how accurate the results can be. Um, as far as I can know, these kind of proposals, analog for analog computation, I mean, you are using analog values, uh, voltage or uh, resistance or 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 current right but uh, but then you need to distinguish between these analog values as well and you need to convert them to digital values right to uh, to to uh, digital uh, to bits essentially and and that um, and 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 there and that's what really defines what's the precision of your calculation so as far as i know well i don't know exactly the uh, pcm crossbar from from ibm folks but uh, these um, crossbars typically provide a um, precision of uh, four bits, eight bits, something like that. So they cannot be very precise at the moment. Um, this is still fine for many different applications. You might be familiar with quantization techniques for neural networks and machine learning. Uh, you can still obtain correct results or very accurate results when operating at low precision. So that's why um the uh, the prototypes are so promising uh, that's one thing to take into account one of the potential drawbacks another drawback is that you really have to do a um, digital to analog conversion before using the crossbar and then the other way around analog to digital right and that requires extra hardware as well and that hardware is not for free so i, I know that in some cases it it might take uh, a large amount of area as well. So uh, that's also another challenge to solve for, for these kind of systems in the future, as well as uh, probably trying to uh, be as well a little bit more general purpose because at the moment they are good, but um, they seem to only perform uh, dot product operations and probably some other operations are enabled as well. And, and, and digital, um, how is it? Uh, yeah, the digital computation is also possible with main restores, with reram and, and other non-volatile memory techniques, non-volatile memory technologies. Does this apply also to uh, like uh, low cloning and uh, <coughs> like the, the other ones um, that do not use uh, 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 receive those like memory liberating stuff? Like the, the first part of the lecture, uh, like for example, Implement majority function. Does there like the process computation of the memory uh, like could influence the reliability of this type of? Uh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, yes, I mean, you you first mentioned crossbars. Uh, if you look at the Ambit paper and the Cindiram paper, uh, one thing that we do is analyzing the reliability as well. So same as you have seen in in compute DRAM that not all rows, not all columns uh, produce correct results. That's what happens as well in our SPI simulations. And in, in, in Ambit and in SIMDRAM paper, for example, uh, you'll see uh, good analysis of what's the uh, percentage of errors when uh, scaling uh, the technology node. Um, I don't remember now, but maybe 35 nanometer, 20 nanometer, and something else, and and as you make the cells smaller, uh, you start observing more errors, but they are still tolerable. Uh, we also compare uh, to to uh, the idea of uh, activating or changing, let's say, the majority function instead of activating three rows at the same time, activating five rows at the same time, because some prior work proposed that as well, going further in the majority operation and activating uh, five rows at the same time, and that can at least in theory um, accelerate operations as well. But when it comes to activating five, then you will see many more errors. And, and that's some analysis we did in the paper as well. Yeah, but very good questions. Thank you. More questions. Um, you mentioned about a real random number and uh, where does it come from? Like. Uh... Physically real, random? Yeah, true random numbers. Yeah, true. true random numbers, yes. Where, where, where do they come from? 
Um, yeah, uh, and it's unfortunate that I don't have uh, any slides here um, and because the presentation was already pretty long. But uh, yeah, um, it, it, there are different uh, different uh, ideas. So the first one is that, that the one that is used in D range um, is uh, essentially violating the D run timing parameters. It activates one row. So, uh, so uh, you know, in order to read one value uh, from DRAM, you, you first need to activate the row and then you need to activate the sense amplifier, right? You, you activate the sense amplifier uh, after certain number of nanoseconds that is given by the standard. And that's necessary because the row, the, the cells need to leak the charge onto the beat line or share the charge with the beat line. And only because you know cells are capacitors are very very small, so this takes time, and uh, so you only activate the sense amplifier when there is a clear deviation in the built in the bit line voltage, either over half DDD or under half DDD, and depending on that, the sense amplifier detects this perturbation, and then it will go to one or it will go to zero, right? Uh, the DRAM latency work proposes to reduce this latency in a way that the deviation of the bit line voltage is not large enough for the sense amplifier to amplify it in the right direction. So uh, if you don't wait, if you don't wait the time, the number of nanoseconds that you have to wait, it won't go to where it has have to go, either one or zero. It will go to some random place, one or zero, but you don't know exactly what, because DRAM is not operating properly, right? Maybe you maybe there was uh, one in the cell and you end up reading one, or maybe there it was one in the cell and you end up reading zero. So that's random. And, and in the end, uh, and in reality, as uh, the paper analyzes, different cells have also different, uh, tend also more frequently to go to zero or to go to one because of process variation, because there are no two cells that are the same or no two transistors that are exactly the same or two sense amplifiers. So that process variation defines or determines in some way how the, uh, the, the bit line voltage is going to change and how the uh, final value in the sense amplifier changes. Um, yeah, thanks for the explanation, but maybe um, that's more physically conditioned or manufacturing condition, then uh, every time you try to generate a random number, they will go to some, some trend. Do you think so? Uh, that, that's uh, indeed something that was, uh, uh, so the, indeed the, the first work, the DRAM latency path takes advantage of that, that is more, uh, uh, it's more likely that some rows, some cells go in one direction or, or in another direction. So there is uh, some uh, inherent uh, characteristic of the components themselves that make more uh, likely one direction or another direction, uh, that's for sure. Um, but, um, but yeah, so that, that's why it can be used for physically uh, and clonable functions that are a kind of a signature of a device, can be a way of identifying a device, in this case, the DRAM memory. Uh, but yeah, basic, basically the same idea, like playing with the timing parameters can also be used to uh, generate the random numbers. One uh, thing to say as well is that it's not as simple as just performing these, uh, you know, changing these uh, the run timings and just reading, and then you have your uh, number, right? The, 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 both these uh, uh, works about true random number, number generation also uh, apply post-processing, and this post-processing post is, uh, is uh, intended to grab the beats that are really random and uh, and use them uh, in a in a smart way to generate for example cryptographic keys and so so yeah that, that that's uh, more or less it and and then the other uh, proposal the quack, uh, the quack trng that one is the one that activates 
uh, four uh, rows at the same time. So that's why you also have sort of random de deviation of the bit line. Right? But as I said, there is always post-processing uh, as well here. And um, in order to really have uh, good quality in the, in the generated random numbers. Yeah, you can find uh, all sort of details in the in the papers and and the corresponding talks as well. That probably will be uh, required readings or or at least uh, recommended reading. So you'll have a chance to to read of the paper. Probably Professor Mudlu will also talk about these works in more detail in later lectures. Okay, what else? If you don't have any other questions, I think uh, we are done. I don't know if there are any questions in YouTube or in uh, Zoom chat, Nika. Okay, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for all the questions. Uh, think about uh, all of these. We will continue talking tomorrow about processing in memory, but probably you will come up with more questions until tomorrow and then during the lecture, I'm pretty sure that uh, you, will, you will have uh, many things to clarify as well and, and how these two processing using memory and processing near memory are connected or, or could be connected. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.